Have you ever done a science experiment and wondered what it'd be like if you did it big? I have. <laughs> yeah! My name is Phil, and I take your everyday science experiments and do them big. This is Science Max, experiments at large. Science Max! Newton's third law is the science behind balloon-powered rocket cars. It's also the science behind a maxed out rocket car that I can ride. Plus bowling balls and an interrupting sign. Today on Science Max, experiments at large. Greetings, Science Maximites. I am Phil McCordick, and this is Science Max Experiments at Large. Today, we're going to be experimenting with the balloon-powered car. Here's how it works. Woohoo! It all has to do with Newton's third law. Newton's third law. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Uh, we don't we don't have to do this now. We can this is all for later. We can build the cars first and then we can uh let's go over here. So how do you build a balloon-powered car? Well, I suggest you be science maximites because there's any number of ways you can build a balloon-powered car. You do not have to follow my design. You should come up with one of your own. It may even be better than the one I built. But I will give you some tips though that make it a lot easier. First of all, you need something to stick your balloon on that has an opening on it. I used a turkey baster for this car. I just pop the top off and remember to tell an adult that you're using the turkey baster. And then you stick the balloon on there and it allows you to attach something to the car and it also makes it easier to blow up the balloon. <laughs> you can use any number of things, even just uh, any kind of tube that you find lying around. It helps you attach the balloon to the car and it helps you blow up the balloon way easier. The other thing you should think about when you make your balloon powered car is how you're going to make the wheels roll. Once you've decided on the base of the car, you could use anything, even just a piece of cardboard like this, you can do your wheels in two ways. The first way is to attach the wheels to the axle. This is how I made the axle of this car. I used a shish kebab skewer and I stuck it inside a straw, just like that. And then I attached the lids to the shish kebab skewer. So the lids and the shish kebab skewer are attached and they rotate in the straw. That's one way to make the wheels turn. The other way is to tape down the axle or whatever you're going to use uh, and have the wheels spin around on the axle. Two great ways to make your wheels turn and it really kind of depends on the wheels you're using. You can make your own design and keep refining it and making it better and faster or do what I like to do and make a whole bunch of different cars. So we've got this one. Uh, this one I made out of paper plates and this is a snorkel. Awesome. This one is the rock car because there's a rock on it. I've got uh, the dragster model. It's a long broom handle and it might not work that well, but who, who knows? And this is my favorite design. It's made out of waffles and an ice cube tray. This is why I make a whole bunch of different cars because I can race them. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday at the Science Maxadrome. It's the balloon powered car winner take all drag race of awesome. First up, the Eliminator. Better late than never, it's the Procrastinator. <laughs> Crushing the competition, it's the Terminator.
<sighs> well, when you build your balloon-powered cars, you can figure out what worked or uh, what didn't work and try modifying your designs to make them work even better. That is science. And now we're gonna max it out because this is Science Max Experiments at Large. So we're gonna take that small balloon-powered car that we just built and we're gonna make it much, much bigger. I'm gonna go to the Center for Skills Development and Training and we're gonna use the science behind the small balloon-powered car and we're gonna make it big. That science is Newton's third law. But there's Newton's plenty of third law. No, there's, for every there's, there's there plenty of time for this later. We're not doing action. we're not doing this bit now. We're doing that bit in a minute. So we can wait, wait, no, I, I said we're doing it later. We're doing it later. <sighs> Whoa. Uh, hi, Sarah. Hi, Phil. This is Sarah, and she's got a master's degree in physics from McMaster University. Right. And we're going to be talking about Newton's third law. Ooh, look out, look out, duck. Uh, sorry, sorry. There was a sign that kept coming in. Um, never mind. Newton's third law. Well, what is that? For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Right. So how does that work with our balloon car? Ah, cool. OK, so if you blow up the balloon, What's going to happen when you release it is the air is going to push out with a certain force, which in turn is going to cause the cart to move forward with the exact same force. Yeah, works great. So how come it doesn't work with my rock cart? Ah, wow. Well, actually, it did work. So the balloon still pushes with the exact same force, which causes the cart to have the exact same force push forward. But your rock is really heavy, so you probably didn't see it move. Oh, so a lighter cart works better with the same amount of force. That's it. Well, there you go. Newton's third law. What? Newton's third law. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. I'm really starting to dislike that sign. Phil, are you OK? Yeah, I'm fine. Our small balloon-powered car works because of Newton's third law. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. The air pushing out the balloon this way pushes the car with the same amount of force this way. So, in order to max it out, the plan is just to get a bigger wheeled cart and a much bigger balloon. So, everything should work out the same. Okay, so, sir, oh, I thought what we would do is I would, in order to max out the balloon-powered car, what we need is a cart to start with, and then I ride it, and we have a giant balloon, and then I go. Do you have a giant balloon? Ha 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 Giant balloon! So, step one, uh, Sarah blows up the balloon. Okay. Wait, 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 wait. Use this air compressor, it'll probably be a lot faster. Sarah and I get to work blowing up the balloon, and it takes a long time. A very long time. Okay, human-sized balloon-powered car test. Take one. All right, Sarah. You got it? Yeah. Okay, let it go. Okay, go, go. Let it go. <laughs> I and did. You did let it go. I just let go. Nothing is happening. It's not coming out fast enough, and you're a bit too massive. I don't think it's gonna work like this. Really? Yeah. Okay, uh, balloon powered car test two. No fill. I'll just take it. And... Ah! What happened? Uh, I don't think it worked. The balloon popped. Phil, are you okay? This is why you wear protective eyewear. Uh, yeah. So, that didn't work? No. No. Should we get another balloon? Uh... I think uh, we need something else. OK, well, the air coming out of the balloon just what, didn't have enough force, so. We need the air to come out with more force. Yeah, do we get, what, a bigger a bigger balloon? I don't think that's going to work. I don't think it's that. I think we need something with compressed air. Oh, like a scuba tank or a? Fire extinguisher, something like that. Yeah, that, that's what we need. OK, sure. Well, we can, all right, so I don't know if that's safe to do that. So we'd have to build, a, like, a cage or yeah, something? Yeah, I don't know if it's going to work on this. All right, well, back. Back to the drawing board. So okay. what we should do is we should get we a... We need to a, find these tanks. We get the tanks, and then we make a, like a frame out of aluminum or something. OK, that could work. Yeah, That's they can hold idea. the tanks, so yeah. they're safe. And then what we should do is... Who was Isaac Newton? He was a mathematician and probably number one on the list of top scientists of all time. 
Albert Einstein said, Isaac Newton was the smartest person that ever lived. You've got to be special if Einstein is calling you smart. Newton's three laws of motion was a huge idea. But did you know Newton also came up with the idea of gravity? The famous story is that in 1666, Isaac Newton was sitting under an apple tree when he watched an apple fall and wondered why. Hey, everyone, I just invented gravity, which was a big relief because up until then, everyone was just floating around. OK, so it didn't happen like that. He didn't invent gravity. He gave a name to this invisible force and then described how it works. Not only did it make things fall down, but it was the same force that kept the moon circling the Earth and the Earth circling the sun. And he invented a new kind of math to explain how. We now call it calculus. See, I told you he was smart. He's very smart. This is hydrophobic coating. Hydrophobic literally means afraid of water, but it's not actually afraid of water. The chemistry of a hydrophobic coating prevents water molecules from penetrating anything you spray it on. You can get this stuff at the hardware store, and if you want, be science maximites and get an adult and think of the coolest thing you could spray with hydrophobic coating. I like to use things that do not go well when you put them in water, like uh, tissue. Yeah, doesn't look great when it gets wet. Here's a tissue coated in hydrophobic coating. Huh? Weird. Or it works the same with a paper towel. Paper towel in water, paper towel covered in hydrophobic coating, stays dry. Or how about a dinner roll? Dinner rolls really don't like water. See? Gross. But a dinner roll coated in hydrophobic coating? Weird. Just don't eat it. Now, it's time to max it out. I have coated half of my lab coat in hydrophobic coating, and the other half, I have not. Hydrophobic coating, regular lab coat. Half of me is wet, and half of me is dry. What's more, half of my outfit ended up being wet and half dry because the lab coat was protecting my outfit from getting wet. Now it's time to max it out even more. We have coated my entire outfit in hydrophobic spray. My shirt, my pants, and my lab coat. The pants have been taped to rubber boots, so no water's getting in there. And my shirt has been taped to my pants, so no water's getting in there. So here's the question. Can I get into the pool and out of the pool and stay dry? Let's find out. In the pool, out of the pool, and I'm still mostly dry. Now, here's what really happened. I got into the pool, and I realized I should have duct taped the pocket, because all the water went in there, down into the rubber boots, started filling up the rubber boots, and now my entire leg is full of water because the hydrophobic coating isn't letting it come out. So the hydrophobic coating isn't keeping the water out, now it's keeping the water in. Let's take a closer look at Newton's third law. Newton's third law. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. OK. All right, let's watch it back. When the sign hits me, I exert a force on the sign in the opposite direction. That makes the sign stop moving. It also exerts an equal force on me, causing me to fly off in this direction. Now, if I was to push this sign, I'm not only pushing the sign this way, but my feet are pushing against the ground in the opposite direction. It's, um, well, it's really easier to see if I'm not standing on the ground. Um, oh, hold on. OK, so, huh? Oh, OK. So now that I'm hanging, watch. I push on the sign, but when I exert force on the sign to make it go this way, I go that way. Well, actually, it's, it doesn't work as well because the sign isn't as heavy as I am. So wait, I have this over here. This is a, a barrel, and it has stuff in it, and it weighs as much as I do. OK, so watch. If I push on the barrel like that, I go away from it as much as it goes away from me. So. There you have it. Newton's. Newton's third. No, hold on. Newton's. Newton's third law. Newton's third law. Okay, go. 
Newton's third law. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So, using a giant balloon to push me on a cart, uh, didn't work. And I... Ah! What happened? The plan now is to use the compressed gas cylinder. Just like a balloon, these cylinders contain a lot of air. If we get a cart and put a gas cylinder in a cage, for safety, on the back and open the valve, the escaping air might have enough force to push me. This is two cubic meters of air. If we were to put it in a balloon, the balloon would be this big. But if we compress the air, we can fit it all into one of these, a steel tank. This is what we're gonna be using next for our air-powered car. Got it? Yep. All right. Good. So Sarah and I have been hard at work and we've built the air-powered cart. We can't call it a balloon-powered cart anymore because now we've got a compressed air tank, so it's not a balloon that powers it. Exactly. Okay, so I'm gonna sit on here, Sarah's gonna turn on the tank, and I'm gonna go. And before we do this, we should say, do not, under any circumstances, try this at home. We are trained professionals. You ready? I'm ready. Okay, high five first. Okay, now we do it. Okay, so before I turn the tank on, make sure your feet are down and the brakes are on. Gotcha. Uh, Don't take them off till I say go. You have got it. All right. Ready. Okay. Yeah, it did work, but I feel I feel like it could work better. You want to go faster? I do want to go faster. This reminds me of the rock car. Yeah. Well, we didn't have a big enough balloon. We need more force. We need more force. So should we get a bigger tank? Let's get more tanks. More, more tanks, more force. You're gonna go faster forward. Newton's third law. Newton's third law. High five. All right, let's do it. All right. Newton's Cradle, and it's a really cool toy that demonstrates all kinds of laws of motion, including Newton's third law. Newton's what you do ball. is you pull this one ball out, and when it hits these balls, they exert force on that ball to make it stop moving, but it exerts force on these balls, which travels through the balls and makes this one on the end fly out, like that. Now, there's a lot going on here, but you can really see how the force is equal that you put in and you get out if you use two balls. I swing two balls up, and two balls go out that side. Isn't that cool? Now, it wouldn't be science max unless we maxed it out, so come on. Whoa! Okay, this is one we built out of bowling balls. Bowling balls. Bowling balls. <laughs> Instead of smaller balls, and I think it's gonna work the same way. Let's find out. You throw one out, and, and ha <laughs> ha! Yeah, it works the same. Okay, now let's try it with two balls. Okay, ready? Wait, 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 wait. And two balls, throw them out. And two balls on that side. All right, so there you have it. Whoa. Newton's third law. Oh. Ah. Newton's third law. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So our single pressurized tank created enough force to move me, but not very fast. The plan now is to do two things. First, we're going to triple the amount of thrust by using three tanks. We're also going to use some pipes that lock into each other to give me an initial push. These pipes slide together, and when the air is turned on, the pressure in the pipes will cause them to slide apart, which will push me forward. After that, I use what's left in the tanks to keep going. All right, now it's time to max it out. I've enlisted the help of a few more Science Max people. Thank you very much, Corey. You'll see now we have three tanks of compressed gas, and we've also got this nifty little contraption. How does this work, Sarah? All right, so each tank is attached to a tube, yeah. and you can see that each tube goes into this one main tube, so when we turn them on, pressure's gonna build up, and we're gonna go forward with more force. Well, that's great, and Reed is stacking cinder blocks. Thanks, Reed, uh, up so that will push uh, the pipe will push against the cinder blocks, and then I'll go that forward. way. All right, well, are you guys ready? I'm ready. All right, let's do it. 
Now, again, I have to say, thank you, Corey. I've got it. This is something you definitely don't want to try at home. We are all trained professionals. We have a physics degree here. We've got TV people that make sure that this is safe. So uh, watch it and enjoy, but please don't try any of this at home. Okay, I'm ready. Sarah, count me down. Three, two, one. Uh oh! Uh oh! Uh oh! oh. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome! That was really awesome! All right, high fives! High fives! Yeah, 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 yeah! <laughs> and it's raining now, so it looks like we're gonna have to stop. So thank you very much for joining us on Science Mac Experiments at Large in our episode on Newton's Third Law. Science Max! This episode ow, of Science Max ow. is all about elastic energy. We use it to build a catapult and a paddle wheel boat, and then we max them out. We even learn some history. Elastic energy, today on Science Max Experiments at Large. Welcome to Science Max Experiments at Large. I'm Phil McCordick, and today we're going to be building one of the most devastating, one of the most powerful machines known to medieval man using a plastic spoon, among other things. We're gonna be building a catapult. Catapults were used throughout history for all kinds of reasons, to throw all kinds of things, but mostly big stone blocks at castle walls in order to knock them down. Here's what you need in order to build your own catapult. You need elastics, uh, pencils, um, unsharpened is fine, plastic spoons, like I said, and popsicle sticks. Popsicle. Popsicle sticks. Popsicle sticks. Um, I'm gonna go wash my hand. So here's the science behind what we're doing today. It's all about elastic force. Elasticity is a property of solid materials, like this elastic, and how much they tend to return to their original shape when deformed, like when I pull on it. Elastics are called elastics because they're great at doing just that. You can pull on it and pull on it and pull on it, and it'll, ow, 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 always return to its original shape. So we are using the power of elastic force today. Ow. Now it's time for a Science Max quiz. Elasticity is the ability for a material to return to its original shape when deformed, like this or this. Which of these materials have elasticity? A rubber band, a pencil, or a rock? Haha! -ha, this is a trick question. The answer is all three. Most solid materials have elasticity. Nearly everything will deform a little and still be able to return to its original shape. It all depends on how much. This is a steel bar. This is an elastic band. And this is an ice cream sundae. We're not talking about ice cream sundaes now, though. So get that out of here. Good. Now a steel bar and an elastic band both have elasticity. A steel bar can be stretched to 1% of its length and still spring back. A rubber band can be stretched 300% or more. The difference between the two is why we make balls out of rubber and buildings out of steel. Because the other way around wouldn't be good for balls or buildings. This has been a Science Max quiz. All right, let's build our catapult. The first step, take four pencils and stick your popsicle stick in between so you have two on the top and two on the bottom. And then use your elastic to go around and around and around. That's why I like building things with elastics because it makes it very fast to tie things together because once you go around and you have it nice and tight, you just pop it over the end and voila, it stays together. And that is how you start making your frame. Put more pencils on that side and another popsicle stick on the other end held on at the corners with more elastics. Then take even more elastics and put them right around the middle until you get this. 
I've added a few more elastics around the middle here, and that is where we're gonna get all of our elastic force. I think I have six. The more you use, the better it's going to work. Take your popsicle stick, stick it in between the elastics, and then start spinning it around. Here's the reason I use pencils and popsicle sticks is because the pencils are a little bit longer, which allows you to twist the popsicle stick around in the middle and build up the elastic force. Now, because I'm twisting, the elastic force we're using here is called torsion or twisting force. When you feel you have enough torsion, pull your popsicle stick down a little bit so it won't unwind on you, and you'll see that you have all kinds of elastic energy. Then, take your spoon and stick it on the popsicle stick, and you can also break off the popsicle stick if you wanna make sure it's the right length. And it works like that. To make the frame, you just need more pencils and elastics. The trick is to make a triangle with two pencils attached to your frame. They should stick up right where your catapult arm would be fully upright. Then, take a final pencil and put it across the top. Don't forget to pull the arm back before you put the pencil across, otherwise it'll end up on the wrong side. Now this is very complicated and I went pretty fast, so if you want the step-by-step -step instructions on exactly how to build this, go to our website. And there you go, a catapult of your very own that you can use to knock down very small castle walls. I've also built a larger catapult using all of the same principles. Pretty good, huh? It's got a longer arm, which means I can throw marshmallows even further, whoa, or I can throw larger marshmallows, or I can throw very large marshmallows. Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Phil, is that the largest catapult you're gonna make? Well, of course not. This is Science Max, experiments at large. I'm headed to the center for skills development and training, and we're gonna max out the catapult so that it's big enough to throw one of these. Hey, Phil. How you doing? All right. This is Zach. He's a mechanical engineer, and you build machines for a living, right? That's right. Great, because I need help building a catapult. OK, but what's with the pumpkin? Well, the pumpkin is what I want to throw out of the catapult. Um, see, I figure we just take the small design, and we just make it so that we can throw one of these. Mm -hmm. What do you think? You're going to need a really big catapult. Yeah, and I'm also going to need some really big elastics. Where do you get those? Well. In medieval times, they used rope to make large catapults. Oh, OK. Well, rope is a lot easier to get, and that would be fine. Uh, and I want to make this arm uh, as long as this piece of wood here. This is going to be a huge catapult. It's a huge catapult. I guess we should build it outside, though, huh? Let's do it. OK, it's, it's over that way. OK. Uh, I'll follow you. Sure. Do you want a hand with that? No, no, I'm fine. You go ahead, and I'll, okay. I'll just, maybe if you hold the door open for me, I could just hold. No, it's... You know what? You go, and I'll, I'll meet you. Make sure you go. Our full-size catapult is going to look a lot like the popsicle stick version. We start with a four-sided frame and add some legs on the bottom. Our spoon is going to be replaced by a long throwing arm with a basket on the end. Then we need a really strong cross brace at the top to stop the arm. Just like in the small version, using a triangle shape is the best because triangles are very strong. Finally, we need something to wind around and around, which is going to give us our elastic force. Instead of elastics, we're going to be using rope for our catapult because rope has just the right amount of elasticity. But unlike medieval times, we're going to be catapulting pumpkins. Once Zach and I got it all put together, it looked like this. OK, we have built a catapult. Check it out. It's pretty solid, and I think it's pretty amazing. And just like in the small catapult, we have our elastic force. But this time, we're using rope. Right, Zach? Yes. OK, and rope will work as well as the elastic did in the small one? Yeah. All right, great. So what do we do? It's really well, loose we need, now. We need to wind this up so oh, that we put some tension okay, into it. Go. 
The reason a catapult works is because the rope is twisted. The elasticity in the rope wants to unwind, which gives the catapult its power. Just like the small wind catapults, the like more that. you wind it, the better it works. Good. Usually in medieval days, they had a whole teams of people doing this job, but it's just me and Zach now. How are you doing, Zach? All right. OK. And then we clamp it on here. So the thing doesn't unwind, right? Yeah. Good. All right, now we have our pumpkin, and we're gonna fire our pumpkin in our castle wall, which is made out of cardboard boxes over there. Pumpkin. All right, here we go. Pulling the arm back. Oh, oh. that elastic force is pretty strong. Okay. How do you think, we're, do you think that pumpkin's a good size? Oh, it's pretty big. You think? Oh, a little too it's big. Too, it's too big for our basket. Yeah. Smaller pumpkin. Smaller pumpkin. I'll hold this. No rush, Zach. No rush. Oh, okay, uh, rush, Zach. Uh, Can't hold. Oh, yeah. Man. Can't hold arm. Okay. Ready? One, two, three. It didn't work that well. No, um, it not that well. Yeah, so it went, and it flew, and it landed here, which is a little farther yeah, away from the wall than I'd short. like it to be. One third of the way to the wall. I don't know if that's enough. What do we do to make it better? Well, the way we're throwing it right now, we just have the pumpkin in a, you know, at the end of the arm. So yep. if we bake, make some kind of a sling so that we fling it as we're bringing it up. We make a sling? Yes. All right, I don't know how to make a sling, but you know how? Sure. All right, we'll make it and then you can explain how it works. Yeah. All right, good. Let's put the pumpkin over here. We'll put it, we'll recycle it later. Max Historica. Good morrow to you. I am Lord Fillington III, and welcome to my medieval castle. Throughout history, lords and kings have built castles and walls to keep people out. I built my castle to protect my prize collection of snow globes. I have so very many, and they're all mine. <laughs> oh, hello! You down there, you can't come in. This is my castle. And throughout history, there have been people who've been wanting to get into those castles because Lord Fillington has been hogging all the snow globes and I'd, well, I'd like to look at them. But the odd part is figuring out how to get into the castle because I can't just come up to the wall and start hammering on it. Huh? Taste the wrath of my water balloon! Because if I get too close to the castle, he can get me. Ha 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 Fortunately, there's this thing called a catapult. Oh, fiddlesticks. They have a catapult. What you do is you put something heavy in the end here, and the catapult fires it at the walls of the castle, knocks them down, all from far enough away that the people in the castle can't get to you. Ah! Oh, I surrender! Don't knock my walls down! Oh, it'll take me all week to fix them! Oh! All right, all right, you can have a snow globe. Oh. <laughs> and that's how catapults were used in history. Oh, so beautiful. <laughs> Back to our maxed out catapult. Our first design threw a pumpkin just like it was supposed to, except it only threw it one third of the way to the wall. Now Zach and I are planning to outfit the catapult with a sling. The sling attaches to the end of the throwing arm and gives the pumpkin a lot more distance to travel. Because the pumpkin is traveling a longer distance in the same amount of time, it will be going faster, which will hopefully get it to the wall or at least a lot farther than before. So we built this sling. How does this work, Zach? Well, we've got one end tied here. Yeah. And then we put the pumpkin in here. Wait, wait, OK, pulling arm down. Pulling arm down. <sighs> OK, yeah, now what? Now we put the pumpkin in here. Put the pumpkin in there. And yeah. And we loop this over the back of the, oh. over that. As the throwing arm goes up, this will slide off the back of the throwing arm and it will release the pumpkin. All right, you're the expert, I believe you. Let's try it out. Three, two, one. Oh. Whoa! Okay, 
That Better. works really well. You know what the problem is, though? We still don't have enough oomph. Yeah, it needs more power. Need, well, so what do we do? Should, I don't know if we can crank that rope anymore. Uh, I think we're at the limit of our rope power, but if we added some more elastic. I thought we weren't going to use elastic. Well, we used elastics in our small demo models. So what if we use some more? Do we have got, elastics? Uh, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I brought have... some in here just in case. What's this? It's uh, surgical tubing. It's like a giant elastic. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess this is elastic force. So do we, do we, do we twist well, here, it we around can... at the bottom there? Well, or? we just wrap it around the throwing arm like this. And we... Oh, I see. So we tie yeah. it here. Yeah, we just need a lot more, and then and then we pull this, and it would be. Oh yeah, that yeah. would make a lot more. So we just need a lot more of this elastic. Uh, what is what is this again? Surgical tubing. Surgical tubing. It's like a giant elastic. Fantastic. All right. Goggles on. Goggles on. Yes. Yes. Mini Here's another fun way you can play with elastic force. Take a milk carton. I prefer Science Max Milk because it's the creamiest. 2% cream, 100% science. Wrap some elastic bands around it with some popsicle sticks on the bottom, sort of like feet. Then take some clamshell packaging, which wraps just about anything you buy nowadays, and cut out a square or a rectangle. Then wrap some tape around that square with an elastic in it and put the elastic on the feet of your milk carton. Then. Wind it around and make sure you go backwards so your paddle wheel boat will go forwards when you put it in the water. And there you go, a paddle wheel boat. Now it is time to max it out. Mattress. I need. I need a, a better name. But I've made a giant paddle wheel boat that will work on elastic force because I've got surgical tubing as my elastics, and that's an air mattress. And then I use some lumber to hold it all together. And of course, I need a paddle wheel. And what better thing to use in a pool than a flutter board? Okay, here we go. So normally you're not allowed to wear your clothes and your shoes in the pool, but I got special permission because of science. Besides, I'm not worried at all, so I didn't wear my swimming outfit because I figure I can totally do this entire experiment without even getting wet. That is how confident I am. All right, now the tricky part, We'll be getting on to the mattress. OK, here we go. Ha <laughs> ha! Whoa. Ha <laughs> ha! The SS Science! Hey, SS Science, that's a great name for this. Look, it works great. And I managed to stay totally dry. Huh? Well, almost. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> you thought I was going to fall in the pool, but I didn't. Uh-oh. My flutterboard has has stopped moving, and I'm, I'm in the middle of the pool. Almost. Yeah. Didn't think this through. No. 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 No, that's not going to work. Maybe I'll... Maybe I'll wait. Our maxed out catapult was working well with the sling we attached to it, but it still didn't make it all the way to the wall. Zach's idea is to attach a bunch of surgical tubing to the cross piece of the catapult. Surgical tubing is pretty much big elastics, so we'll have two places we're getting elastic force from, the rope and the surgical tubing. Hopefully this design is enough to help our catapult fling a pumpkin far enough to hit the castle wall. All right, here we go. Uh, you hold that. I get this. We got our system down now. OK. Oh. This goes up to there. OK. OK. Three, two, one. Uh, nope. <laughs> ah. 
One, two, three. Oh! Oh! oh it went too far. It went too far. We are, that's so good. Oh, man. All right. OK, all right. so all we got to do is move the catapult back. So you get that side. I'll get this side. And we'll move the catapult. See, now our catapult is too good. We got to back it away from the castle. All right. Let's go again. Aha, pumpkin. Pumpkin. Pulling arm back. Pulling arm back. Uh, Grunting. Yeah. Loading pumpkin. Loading. Hooking rope on arm. Hooking rope on arm. More grunting. More grunting. Uh, pulling back strongly. One, two, three. Oh. Oh. Oh, wow. <laughs> Woo. We're inside the castle. We're still inside the castle. Oh, man. It's an excellent shot, though. So what do we do? Move the catapult back? Yeah. Move the catapult back! What about so here? Here. Here we go again. Pumpkin! Pumpkin? Loading arm. Loading arm. All right, you ready? You think it's gonna work? We've got we've done every modification we can possibly do. So you think it's gonna work this we time? We did it, it's gonna work. Okay, here we go. I'm excited. All right, ready? Ready. One, two, three. Whoa! Yeah! Woohoo! High fives! Well, there you have it. Awesome job. Now we need to throw fingers to see who gets to rebuild the castle. Okay? One, two, three! Oh, thanks very much for joining us. Let's just take a break. I'll rebuild the castle. <laughs> you see, this is exactly how catapults used to work. They'd hit the same part of the wall over and over until they made a big hole, and that would weaken the wall. Fortunately for me, it's really easy to fix. Uh, just put this right in here. Oh, man. It's time to get stuck on magnets. What's our attraction to magnets? What's their attraction to each other? And can I use magnets to levitate and float in the air? All on this episode of Science Facts Experiments at Large. Greetings, Science Maximites. Welcome to Science Max Experiments at Large. My name is Phil, and today we're going to be looking at the power of mag magnets. You see, magnets are fun things to experiment with because they are really, okay, they're really interesting. Um, this magnet that I've got here is a neodymium magnet or a rare earth magnet. It's one of the, oh, one of the, one of the strongest magnets you can get. Um, a magnet is an object that is attracted to uh, anything that is ferromagnetic, which is iron, nickel, or cobalt. And mag magnets are interesting because they have two sides. There are two, uh, oh, there are two poles. I'd show you, but I can't rip the chain off. Hold on one second. Ha-ha. Mm. There are two. Oh, no. There are two poles to every magnet, uh, just like the Earth. There is a North Pole and a South Pole. That's right, the Earth is a giant magnet. So if you take kitchen magnets, you'll find that there's two different poles. I've written North and South on these ones. They don't normally come like that. If you put the North and the South together, they stick. But if you put the North and North or South and South together, they repel. They repel, see? They don't want to go together at all. And you can force them together if you want, but if you do, they will spring away the second you let them go. Woo! <laughs> but when magnets repel each other, I find that some of the most interesting stuff. Check this out. This is just a small container, and I've got a magnet in here, and I have a loony attached to it so that it fits nicely in the container like that. For the top, I've attached two magnets together, and I have another coin on it. And if you put them in there, 
I've made sure that the two poles repel each other, which means this magnet will just sit there and float. Magnetic levitation. Very interesting. And you can pop the top on that if you want and just carry around a levitating magnet. Now, there's a couple fancier ways you can levitate stuff with magnets. This is just a wooden frame I've made. Uh, this is completely not necessary. You can use just about anything in your house. A desk lamp works really well. The important part is I've tied a magnet to the end of this arm here, and this is a bolt, which is attracted to the magnet, but it's got a thread tied to it, so it can't get there just far enough that it will actually hang in mid-air. Look at that, it's not attached to anything, it's just being pulled up by the attraction from the magnet. The thing is, as soon as you pull the bolt away far enough, it will lose the attraction and it'll just fall. Very cool. Here's one that's a little bit more complicated, but is also really neat. This one uses disc magnets, which have a circle or a hole in the middle of them here. And you put two around a pencil and then four more in such a position that you can put the pencil against this wood on the side and it will just levitate on its own. You can even give it a spin. Look at that. And if you want to make a levitating pencil yourself, there's step-by-step -step instructions on how to build an easy-peasy version on our website. Meantime, we are going to max this out. Magnetic levitation on Science Max experiments at large. But you're probably thinking, what are we going to levitate? Well, we're going to levitate me. At least, that's the plan. That's why I'm going to the center for skills development and training. Come on. room I've ever been in. Where, where am I? What's going on? I... Hey, Matt. Hi, Phil. This is Matt. He's from Jobmaster Magnets. Now, you guys use lots of big magnets, right? That's right, we do. Awesome. So maybe you could help me max out this. Wow. You did a great job of building the levitating pencil experiment. Yeah, so what's going on here exactly? Well, all magnets have at least a north and a south pole. Right. And when you put like poles together, they want to repel. Oh, OK. So have you ever levitated a person? Not yet. Well, let's do it. All right. Do you think we can use these? We can try. OK, well, uh, put that one on the ground. And OK, so north. And I'll put the north one on my foot here. And then if I just step, oh, wait a minute. If I step, stop moving. If I step on the, step on the, OK. Well, first of all, the, this magnet keeps sort of moving right. away from me when I try to push down on it. Uh, what do we do? How do we fix this? Well, we need to keep the magnets in position so that they don't move around when you try to put them together. Yeah, because I have to come straight down on it. Don't That's I? right. So why don't we attach this one to the floor? Good idea. And then we'll put a board on this one and we'll see how it goes. Perfect. Okay, let's do it. All right. This is a magnet. This is a magnet. This is a magnet. This is a shoe. What's the difference? To know that, you have to know your magnets. This is a donut. It does not stick to this magnet. This is a spoon. It sticks to this magnet. These paper clips stick to this magnet. This shoe does not. So what is attracted to magnets? Only things that are ferromagnetic. Here's the difference. Horseshoe, horseshoe magnet. This one is a magnet. This one is not. But the horseshoe sticks to the horseshoe magnet because this one's a magnet and this one is ferromagnetic. Only things that are ferromagnetic are attracted to magnets. Things that are not attracted to magnets, they're not ferromagnetic. Plastic, banana, mitten, sandwich, magazine. No, but how 
do you know? Do you go around the world sticking a magnet to every single thing one at a time? Hey, Ma, I need you to come over. I need to see if you're ferromagnetic. No, ferromagnetic. No, you don't need to do that. First of all, only metals are ferromagnetic. So that eliminates all your clothing, your luncheon meats, your magazines, what have you. Everything that's not metal, you don't need to worry about. You, never mind, Ma, it doesn't matter. But this clock is metal. It doesn't stick. Well, not all metals are ferromagnetic. Mainly just the ones with iron, nickel, or cobalt. And there you have it. Now you know your magnets. I hit the phone on the magnet there. Okay, uh, can you hear me, Ma? Hang up the phone. Hang up. Hang up the phone, Ma. My first attempt at levitating had the magnets sliding all over. So the plan is to take the bottom magnet and attach it to a big wooden board so it won't go anywhere then attach another plank to the top magnet to make it a little easier to stand on. Okay, that uh, is definitely attached to the floor. Thank you. All right, now, if I just get this lined up, whoa, look at that. It could totally, oh, wait a minute, totally. It doesn't want to stay put. Oh, wait a minute. They levitate. Come on. Levitate. Why doesn't it want to stay? It just doesn't. Hmm. Should I stand on it? Okay, I'll stand on it. Here we go. And ah, ha! Ah. Am I levitating? No, no. Hmm. So why isn't this working? Well, just like your pencil experiment, we need a shaft through the center to hold the magnets in position. Oh yeah, maybe we could use like a ring magnet. Yes. That like we use with the pencil. Right. And? And we're gonna need stronger magnets. We're gonna need stronger magnets. Are the ring magnets strong? Yes, they can be. Awesome, all right, let's do it. All right. Now it's time for a Science Max quiz. Which one of these things do we have magnetism to thank for? Birds flying south in the winter, music, or a sandwich? If you picked A, you're right. Some birds migrate in the spring and fall using the Earth's magnetic field. Many animals can sense the Earth's magnetic field and use it to navigate. Migrating birds fly hundreds or thousands of kilometers north or south when they migrate in the spring and fall. A compass works the same way, by using magnetism to point to the Earth's magnetic north pole. But if you picked B, music, you're right! Here's some music. The way you're hearing this music is because the musicians recorded their instruments using microphones, which use magnets. And then the signal was translated by a computer and stored on its hard drive, which uses magnets. Then it was broadcast to your TV and comes out your speakers, which use, you guessed it, magnets. And for those of you who said you have magnetism to thank for your sandwich, Haha! <laughs> well, you're right. You see, you'd probably go to the kitchen to make that sandwich, right? Well, I'm guessing you got all of the tasty ingredients from your refrigerator? Well, it works on electricity, which is produced by magnets. And then there's an electric motor in the fridge that circulates the air and keeps it cool. And guess what? Magnets. And finally, the door on your fridge stays closed because the door has magnets. So there you go. You can thank magnetism for birds flying south, music, and your sandwich. It just goes to show, when you're talking about magnets, everybody wins because magnets are everywhere. This has been a Science Max quiz. Here's an experiment you can do with a bag of water. Take a sharpened pencil and carefully push it through the bag. If you do it carefully, it won't spill. The reason this works is because the bag is made of polymers, long stretchy chains of molecules, and also because the pressure of the water against the pencil prevents any water from spilling out. Now, we're gonna max it out. 
this is a very large bag of water, and here I have some very large pencils. You ready? Oh. <laughs> That's one. That's two. Here we go. Should I go from the bottom? Ta-da! Science! Okay, okay, okay. <sighs> I know what you want. <laughs> like I was saying, science! Turns out, trying to balance two repelling magnets on top of each other is pretty much impossible. Here's why. This is a magnet, and here is the magnetic field. It's often drawn with lines like this, but actually the magnetic field radiates out in all directions. Really, think of the magnetic field kind of like a ball. When you try to balance another magnet on top of the first magnet, it's about as hard as balancing one ball on top of another ball. So here's the plan. Just like the levitating pencil, we're going to use ring magnets because we can put a shaft through the center of one ring, then drop another ring magnet on the shaft. It will keep them perfectly aligned. Then it's just a matter of putting the bottom magnet on a board to keep it stable and using another board so I can stand on it and ta-da! Magnetic levitation! Or at least that's the plan. Okay. Board. Magnets. Magnets. Ooh, look at that. Awesome. And now I'm gonna put the platform on. Nice! I got some weights here. Let's see how this works. Yeah! This is gonna work amazing. All right, think I should try it? Give it a try. Okay. Here we go. Huh? Huh? Yeah! I'm doing it! I'm levitating! What? Just a little bit. Oh, really? Yeah. So, hmm. Yeah, what do we do? We need more power. More power? I like that idea. How do we give it more power? Uh, more shafts, more magnets. Okay, sure. Well, why don't we do um, why don't we do one, two, three, four shafts, and then we'll have magnets on all the shafts. Great idea. All right, let's do it. If you attach something ferromagnetic like this washer to a magnet, not only does it stick, but the magnetic field travels down the metal, making it a magnet too which means you can stick more and more things to each other, and they will continue to stick until you run out of magnetic field. You can do this yourself at home with anything ferromagnetic. Paper clips work pretty well, or washers like I have, or screws, or bolts, and they'll continue to stick to each other as long as the magnetic field is strong enough. You can see it's getting pretty weak here. And they'll all stay magnetized as long as the first one is still attached to the magnet. But if you want to go even further, all you need to do is keep adding more magnets to reinforce the magnetic field. I've got a few here like this. Let's get the chain started like that. And then I've got a magnet attached to this washer so it will keep the magnetic field strong. And I continue to add um, one magnet, one washer, and we'll just see how far I can go. You can even sculpt it a little bit. Look at that. And then at the end, a whole bunch of paper clips. Eventually, the weight will make it fall off, but it's a lot of fun to play with magnets and make art. Speaking of art you can make with magnets, you can also make sculptures. When everything sticks to everything else, you can make some pretty fancy designs. This is a rare earth magnet, a very strong one, and a bunch of nuts that I've gotten. And this one here is an electromagnet, but electromagnets are a little different because they need an electric current to work. Check this out. This is sort of a magnet dude with crazy hair. 
There's an earth magnet here, and this is a giant screw, and these are some metal bits, and then I've got two more magnets at the top here to hold on his crazy wire hair. He's got crazy wire hair because he's crazy magnet, dude. Now, of course, we couldn't just talk about magnetic sculptures without maxing it out, so let's max it out. This is a bunch of scrap metal from leftover experiments, and I've got a bunch of rare earth magnets, and now I'm going to max out a magnet sculpture. Let's see. There you go, a maxed out magnet me. I made this guy out of metal pipes with earth magnets in between. And these are his arms attached, of course, with magnets. His hand, his little metal pieces attached with magnet. Steel wool for the hair. And of course, hat non-magnetic. All right, here we go. Ready? Uh, uh. Want to see a magic trick? Simple copper tube. Drop things through it. Nothing unusual happens. But watch when I drop a magnet through. What? It's not magic, it's science. Because the magnet creates a magnetic field, when it goes through the tube, the magnetic field repels the magnet upwards. Now, the field isn't perfect, so the magnet doesn't come to a stop. But still, it slows down from a fall to a nice, graceful drop. Take a look from above. Pretty amazing, right? Magnets, not magic, science. So I've managed to levitate on some magnets, but just barely. What Matt and I needed was more power. So instead of having one shaft and one pair of ring magnets, we're going to use a larger board and put a shaft on each corner. Then we'll have four times the power because we're using four times the magnets. Hopefully this will be strong enough to get me floating on a cushion of magnetic energy. And magnets? Magnets. Okay, here we go. <laughs> this is gonna work great. And top board. Mm-hmm. Ooh, what do you think? Looks great. Yeah. Okay, here we go. Matt? You're levitating. I'm levitating! Woohoo! All right. It feels cool. It's sort of like, it sort of feels like surfing a little bit. All right, thank you so much, Matt. That was amazing. And there you have it. Science Max, experiments at large, magnetic levitation. You know, I'm surprised we could do an entire episode on magnets, and we never actually got them so close to the camera that the camera went all weird, because cameras of magnets, they don't, oh dear. Uh-oh. Um, no, that's okay. I can, I can, well, I can fix this. If I just, maybe, no. If, maybe if I put the magnet to the camera again, that would, oh, oh, okay, that's not. Uh, no. That didn't help. Oh, okay, well, thanks very much for watching uh, Science Max. Experiments at large, and uh, we'll see you again uh, as soon as we, we get a new camera. Science Max! Today on Science Max, we're looking at... Chemicals! 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 Chemicals make up everything around us, and we're finding out which ones you can mix together to make spectacular science. Whoa! Woo! Cutest science ever. Today on Science Max, experiments at large. Greetings, Science Maximites. My name is Phil McCordick, and the name of the show is Science Max Experiments at Large. Today, we're taking a closer look at chemistry. Ooh. Chemistry is the science of atoms and molecules, the things that make up all matter, and how they interact with each other. Take, for example, this glow stick. Actually, don't take it, because I, I, I kind of need it. The glow stick doesn't glow until you... Um... The glow stick doesn't glow until you break the barrier and mix the two chemicals and they start to glow. Huh? Pretty cool, huh? Chemistry! Now the chemical reaction we're looking at today is the old vinegar and baking soda volcano. But this reaction doesn't have anything to do with volcanoes. It's chemistry. Now, this experiment is totally safe, but I do recommend you get an adult's permission before you do it, because it's very messy. Uh, uh, 
Yeah. <laughs> First, you're gonna want baking soda and vinegar. These are your two main ingredients, but you'll also want dish soap and red food coloring if you want it to look a little bit more like lava. Now, I like to mix the baking soda, red food coloring, and dish soap together with a little warm water, so all you have to do is add the vinegar. And when you do, this is what happens. And there you go, chemical reaction. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Phil, how much vinegar or baking soda do I use? Well, I'm not gonna tell you. This is where you can be science maximites. Try different amounts. More vinegar, more baking soda, more dish soap. Who knows? Write down the amounts each time you use it and find out what amounts work best. That's called science. And that's what we're gonna be looking at today. Chemistry in all its forms. And of course, because it is Science Max, experiments at large, we're going to max out the vinegar and baking soda volcano. So I'm off to the Center for Skills Development and Training. Come on. Hey, Talina. Hi, Phil. How you doing? Good, how are you? Good. This is Talina. She's going for her PhD in chemistry from McMaster, right? Yep. Awesome, which means you can help me max out the baking soda and vinegar. We need vinegar. Can you grab that vinegar? And vinegar volcano. So. What happens when we mix these two chemicals? Well, vinegar is an acid and baking soda is a base, and when you mix them, they neutralize each other to produce carbon dioxide and water as a byproduct. Hmm, so acids and bases are kind of like opposites. Yep. So I guess that makes sense. When you put them together, crazy stuff happens. Yeah. Awesome, chemistry. Okay, so I want to use this much vinegar and this much baking soda. What's with the fish tank? The fish tank is where I want to mix it all together. What do you think? Awesome. Maxed out. Okay, uh, let's move the fish tank somewhere where we won't make a huge mess. It's a little heavy with all that. Can we get it? Uh, no, we're gonna have to. We're gonna have to take a couple trips. That's kind of heavy. Okay, so we'll take this and that, and then this and, then, and that. No, hold on. I can do it. One, one more. Okay, good. Okay, good. Yeah. Uh, I took too much. I took too much. Uh oh. Uh oh. That's good, Ramona. Put it in the, put it in the background. Put the sign in the background. Yeah, in the BG. I love the BG. Chemicals, 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 chemicals. What are chemicals? Are they things you have in a lab in a jar that say chemical on them? Well, yes. But if that's all you think chemicals are, then you need to know your chemicals. Turns out the stuff in the jar is a chemical, but the jar itself also made of chemicals. The table I'm putting it on, made of chemicals. My lunch, chemicals. Roller skate, chemicals. My jacket, chemicals. This guitar, chemicals. My shoe, chemicals. This watch, chemicals. This fish, chemicals. Chemicals, 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 chemicals. Me, chemicals. You, chemicals. Ramona, chemicals. No, I said you're chemicals. Chem, never mind. This is it, the periodic table of the elements. All matter in the universe is made up of these pure elements. They go together in different ways to make up everything, all matter. Think of it like building blocks. These little atoms are some of the elements on this periodic table. You got one oxygen, two hydrogen, bam, you got a water molecule. One carbon, two oxygen, hey, it's carbon dioxide. Two carbon, two oxygen, four hydrogen, skadoosh, vinegar. One sodium, one chlorine, hey, that's salt. All matter in the universe is just the stuff on here combining into these. And now, you know your chemicals. Mmm, sugar. Let's take a closer look at what's going on when we mix vinegar and baking soda. All chemicals are made of atoms. There's only four types in our reaction. Carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and sodium. When they go together like this, this is a molecule of vinegar, or acetic acid. 
And this is a molecule of baking soda, or sodium bicarbonate. When chemicals react, they switch atoms. That one goes there, this one goes over here, and then this one turns into this, and then what you end up with are new molecules. This one is called sodium acetate, and this one is carbon dioxide gas, the gas you breathe out. And do you recognize this one? Right, water, H2O. Why all this happens gets complicated, but the study of chemistry is all about how molecules are built and react with other molecules. All right, Talina, you ready? Yeah. You're gonna pour all your baking soda in the fish tank, and I'm gonna pour the vinegar into this bucket, because you don't wanna, don't wanna pour them together right away. Are okay, you ready? Yep. Okay, go for it. When you're doing your PhD in chemistry, do you get to do stuff like this? Yeah. Really? Got to do a lot of fun reactions in the lab. Oh, that's, I'm, I'm jealous. <laughs> have you ever done this much vinegar and baking soda in one time? I can't say I ever have. There you go, that's what I like to hear. I already put the soap in the bucket so it would mix with the vinegar when I poured it in. Are you done your baking soda already? I am. I'll pour faster. <laughs> oh, it's faster. It smells vinegary. It smells vinegar. It makes me want french fries. <laughs> okay, Celine, you take this very full bucket of vinegar and dish soap. Thank you. I will take this one. Uh-oh, we still have our third bucket. Okay, I'm gonna, I'll do these both at the same time. Okay, ready? On the count of three. One, two, three. Whoa! 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 <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's awesome. So the one thing it didn't do, it didn't shoot up in the air, though. Yeah, it's because the top is quite open, so you would need to constrict it to get it to shoot up. Oh, yeah, because we're using just sort of a square, mm -hmm. a rectangular prism container. We should get something that's maybe something more like our vinegar bottle, right? Because yeah. there's lots of space down here, but then it forces it into a tighter opening at the top there, um, like a volcano. Yeah. And what else can we do uh, to make it even more powerful, max it out? Vinegar is only 5% acid. The rest is water, so you could try using 100%. So what kind of acid is vinegar? It's acetic acid. So vinegar is actually only 5% acetic acid yep. and 95% water. So you can get 100% acetic acid? Yeah. Can you get 100% acetic acid? Yes. Awesome. <laughs> Why don't we get a container that's sort of shaped like a funnel, like mm -hmm. a volcano, yeah. and 100% acetic acid, and we'll do it again. Sounds good. All right, let's do it. Our vinegar and baking soda reaction went pretty well. But now we're gonna try it with a much stronger type of the same kind of acid you find in vinegar. Carefully putting this down. And watch out for the baking soda. You never know when it'll get out. And well, I guess that's just baking soda, huh? Yeah, that's pretty safe. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> so this is baking soda vinegar volcano version two. We have this differently shaped glass. What do you call this again? That's an Erlenmeyer flask. Why is it called that? It's actually named after a scientist. Did he look like that? Was he sort of shaped like this? No. No? Was he just a good chemist? Good scientist, and I think he designed the glass. Oh, see, there you go. So if you want to have a glass named after you, be a good chemist and design a <laughs> glass. I want to make a fill beaker. So this is 100% acetic acid. Yep. And what's the difference between this and vinegar? Vinegar has 5% of this and 95% water. But this is 100%, so it's much stronger. Much stronger. Can you put this on your french fries? No, I wouldn't be putting it on your french fries. No? As chemicals go, how dangerous is this? It's not too dangerous, but you definitely don't want to be breathing it in, and you don't want to be eating it. Or getting it on your skin. That's why I'm wearing these fancy pants gloves. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pour the acetic acid in this. What's this called? That is a graduated cylinder. Because it finished school. <laughs> so it graduated. Now you're going to mix water and food coloring and soap all together. Yep. And pour it into there. It'll help dissolve some of the baking soda, so hopefully it'll react better with the acid. Sounds good. Face protection. Oh. All right, that's good. And now, when we do it, I want to add the funnel at the end to, like, accentuate the concentration of but I don't know if it's gonna go so fast that I won't be able to get it in there, but we'll try it. Try it. Vinegar baking soda volcano version two. Woo! <laughs> 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 Good thing you got the mask. It smells a lot like vinegar. It's really strong. <laughs> oh. 
That was pretty good. But what, what can we do to make it even bigger? Well, you could try using a different chemical reaction. Ooh, okay. Like what? The decomposition of hydrogen peroxide produces oxygen gas, and so that one's pretty vigorous if you use a catalyst. So we want something that makes a lot of gas so that it makes a lot of bubbles when you put the soap in it. Yep. Great, let's do it. And the sooner we leave that smell, the better, I think, for my, for my taste. Today, we're combining two different chemicals to create a reaction. Sometimes chemicals can combine in a way that makes them very different from how they started out. For example, this is sodium, or Na, on the periodic table. Now, the sodium tablets are in mineral oil because sodium reacts very strongly with water, even the water in the air, or especially the water in my skin. Watch what happens when I drop a sodium tablet into this beaker of water. Very cool and very dangerous. And this is chlorine, or Cl, on the periodic table. Chlorine gas is very poisonous. So, <clears throat> so what happens if we combine these two deadly substances? Do we create some sort of super poison? Something more deadly than anything else known to science that causes fear and chaos in chemistry labs all over the land? No, we create Salt, good old normal table salt. These two substances combine to make NaCl, salt. Something completely and totally safe. Chemistry. Oh, oh, oh. We've gone from vinegar and baking soda to 100% acetic acid in baking soda, and now we're doing the... Vinegar and baking soda volcano version three. No longer vinegar and baking soda. No. Nope. What are we using this time? So here we have some hydrogen peroxide. Oh, that's the stuff you use at home to put on a cut, right? Yeah, but the stuff at home is only 3%. This one's 30. So much, much stronger, much... 10 times stronger. Yes. And is this more dangerous? It's definitely corrosive, so... Wear your gloves. Corrosive means it could eat your skin. It can burn your skin a little Which bit. is why we are wearing gloves and blast shield. What's gonna mix with this? So here we have some potassium iodide, which is a salt, mm -hmm. and it's mixed in with some water. The most important part of this reaction is the fact that it creates gas. Oxygen Which gas? makes bubbles when you put in dish soap, right? Yep. So one big squirt of dish soap like that. Mix it up. Now we go over to the blast zone. That's plenty. All right. No. <laughs> now that's a reaction. It looks like there's steam coming off here. Why is that happening? Well, it is an exothermic reaction, so heat is being generated as the reaction proceeds. Oh, cool. Can we lift our visors now? Yep. Awesome. And what's being released? What's the gas that's coming off here? So it's oxygen gas that's being produced. Oxygen. Ah. <sighs> what we want to do is make this even bigger, but first, can we do it again? Sure. Because I have an idea. Hold on. <laughs> I think we should repurpose our old volcano. What do you think? Sounds like a good idea. OK, so if we put it over here. All right, volcano version 3.5. <laughs> Hydrogen peroxide, potassium iodide. Right, here we go. Whoa! Looks like lava. Whoa! <laughs> Look at that. That, now that is a big volcano eruption. Just covered the town. That is completely, the, yes. That town is going to be very clean because it's all soap bubbles. It's the cleanest volcano this side of Science Maxville. So I still think we can do this bigger, though, right? I agree. Um, oh, I know. What if we use some sort of uh, a tube, like, like, like maybe one of these, right? And then we attach it to um, like an air compressor. I think you'd get some height. Yeah, and we go outside. The atom in 60 seconds. The atom is the smallest unit in a chemical element. A 
atoms are made of three parts. Part number one are these guys, protons. They have a positive charge. The number of protons determines the element. One is hydrogen, two is helium, three is lithium, and so on. The protons sit in the middle here, which is called the nucleus. They sit in here with part number two, these guys. They're neutrons and they have a neutral charge. Now I've got eight protons and eight neutrons in this nucleus, making this an atom of oxygen. Orbiting around the nucleus are these tiny guys. They're electrons and they have a negative charge. I will demonstrate using kittens. Kittens are perfect because just like electrons, kittens are really small. And just like electrons, kittens move around randomly. You never know where they're going to be, but an oxygen atom should have eight kittens or uh, electrons somewhere inside. These kittens are constantly escaping, but guess what? That happens with electrons too. There you go, the atom, a nucleus of protons and neutrons surrounded by randomly moving electrons. Cutest science ever. How do you guys feel? Did you learn something? Huh? Pause up, who learned something? Hmm? Alina and I have made a bunch of chemical reactions, but in our quest to max things out, we've got a new plan. Hydrogen peroxide and potassium iodide create gas. One way to max out the reaction is to contain the gas in something like a tube. We're gonna put the hydrogen peroxide in the tube first. Then we're gonna put in the potassium iodide in the top through a one-way valve. Then we're gonna pressurize the container. When it finally reacts, it will shoot up through the valve and we'll see how high we can get our stream of bubbles to go. But be warned, capping anything and not letting it escape is never a good idea. So we've got a release valve to make sure things work out. This is one of those experiments that's definitely on the list of don't try this at home. Vinegar baking soda volcano version four, hydrogen peroxide potassium iodide. And what we're gonna do this time is we're gonna put it in this tube. Hydrogen peroxide goes in here. And we've got, Talina, do you have the potassium iodide and syringes? Yeah, two syringes full. Two syringes full. About there is good. And then soap. Good amount of soap in there. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna close this off and tighten it up. And then we're gonna pressurize the whole system. And then we're gonna add the potassium iodide and it's going to be spectacular, we hope. Okay, that's on tight. This is all good, putting this down here. And potassium iodide goes in here. Ready? Puts down, ready? One, two, three, go. And we back away slowly. Whoa! Whoa! <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Okay, let's check it out. Woo! All right, there you go. Vinegar and baking soda volcano maxed out. Thank that's you, Talita. Awesome. That was great. If you guys want any instructions for the stuff that we've done today, they're all on the website. And thank you very much for watching Science Max Experiments at Large. We kind of need to clean up a lot, don't we? Yeah. We have out here, we have the other room. So tell you what, uh, you get a mop, I will get the hose and a wheelbarrow for the sun. Science Max! Three, two, one. We're really under pressure during this episode of Science Max. Compressing a gas till it's pressurized is how we can do this, and this, and to a lesser degree, this. Help, I'm being crushed by all this pressure. Pressure, today on Science Max Experiments at Large. Phil to Mission Control, come in Mission Control. Uh, this is Mission Control, Phil. Uh, we read you loud and clear. I would, oh. Greeting. Greeting, science. Greeting, science. Greeting, science maximites. Welcome to Science Max Experiments at Large. My name is.
Phil McCordick, and today we're gonna be building an air-powered rocket. Too difficult, you say? Nonsense, it's easy. It's not like it's rocket science. Hey, it is rocket science. Cool! Here's what you need. You need a bottle and a cork. Make sure that the cork fits nicely into the bottle, and then you need an air pump, because you can't have an air-powered rocket without air. And on this air pump, you need a pin, the special kind that you use to inflate basketballs or volleyballs or stuff like that. Now, what you want to do is push the pin through the cork. You might want an adult's help for this. Push it through until it goes through on the other side, and then make sure you get a good seal with the bottle. Now you're ready to launch your rocket with air pressure. But first, let's do a few other things. Take your cork and put it in a tripod launcher. You can make this out of pencils or anything you want, as long as it stands up nice and solidly. And then, of course, you want to decorate your bottle so it looks like a rocket. This is my rocket. Pretty good, right? So stick the bottle on the cork like before, like that. And then you stick the pin in the bottom. And what we're going to do is we're going to inflate the bottle with air pressure, and then it's gonna launch. Okay, here we go. Uh, you know, rocketry really isn't something you should do indoors. Come on. This will do nicely. <laughs> now, don't forget to do this with an adult and don't forget your safety glasses. Now set up the rocket in a nice big open area and make sure it's pointed away from you. And then what you do is you pump the air pump and it puts air into the rocket, which pushes down on the water, which will push down on the cork until eventually <laughs> so, be science maximites and come up with your own rocket design. Try different amounts of water, different fins, even a different size bottle. Try it for yourself and see if you can get one that goes higher than mine just did. How did I get in? I think it was this way. Do you want step-by-step -step directions on how to build your own air-powered rocket? Well, don't worry. Everything you need is on our website. All right, now it is time to max out our air-powered rocket. I've got Adam here. Hey, Adam. Hey, Phil. How you doing? Good, how are you? Good. Adam's from Logics Academy. Logics Academy, and you guys go into schools and talk about science. We do. Fantastic. Do you guys do a air-powered rocket? Yes, exactly. does, does it look like this one? It looks exactly like that. Oh, that's great. So how do we max this out? So we want to add more pressure to this bottle to try to get it to launch a little bit higher. More air. More air. Great, so what do we do? So we're going to use one of these. Ooh, the air compressor. Right, which works a lot like the bike pump, right? Yeah, exactly. Cool. So we're going to have compressed air coming from here, through this tube, into underneath here, yeah. and out that nozzle there, and you're going to put your bottle on top. And out the nozzle so into that. the bottle, like that. Yep. Yeah. and now we want to be able to hold it in place. So we're going to have these little fingers here that are actually going to work to hold it until we want to let it go. So we're going to lock it in place. Oh yeah, look at that. Totally locked. Exactly. And then what? How do we launch now, it? Now, you're going to take this cord and go a safe distance away, and we are going to pull it. And then we would pull it. <sighs> Which one do you want to start with? I think we should use this one here. OK, great. Now we put water in it, right? Yep, you're going to put water why, in there. Why do we use water? So the water is going to act to push the rocket up into the air. The air is going to, the compressed air in here is going to shoot the water out the back, uh -huh. and the water is going to push on the rocket and make it launch. It's just to give it a little extra push. How do I get it on there without spilling any water? So just rest it next to the just launcher go fast? there. Yeah, just go really fast. Ooh. There we go. There, there we go. A little bit. <laughs> and then lock it in place. Locking it in place. There's okay. no air pressure in the hose yet, right? Yeah, no. First, we have to spool out the launch cord. So the air compressor has the compressed air in it. It's ready to go. Yep, it's all ready to go. We just need to connect the hoses. Adam, I've noticed it's snowing a little bit. Do you think that's any reason why we should stop? 
I don't think so. No, the science must go on. Blast shields down. Connecting hoses. When we connect the air hose, the pressure from the compressor travels down the line and into the bottle. You can see the bubbles of air going in. Those bubbles are carrying more air into the bottle, giving it more pressure. Here we go. Three, two, one. <laughs> All right. There's the rocket. Let's do it again. Launch it again. Three, two, one. <laughs> nice. Success. Success. Nice. So, small bottle, worked really well. How do we make it bigger? I know, a uh, bigger nose cone? I think a bigger bottle. Oh, a bigger bottle, yeah, of course, that's easy. Uh, how about this empty water bottle that we have now? That might work, except that the top here is too big, and I don't think it'll fit on our launcher. Oh, yeah, so what should we use? A two liter pop bottle might work a bit better, because it'll be about the same size. Oh, that's right, two liter pop bottles have the same opening as, as these small, small, small water bottles. Exactly. That's great. All right, let's uh, make a couple rockets out of two liter pop bottles. Awesome. Pressure happens when you squeeze something or compress it. Solids do not compress very well. I will demonstrate. Um, solid? Is it compressing? No, okay. Liquids don't compress very well either. You can demonstrate this for yourself by getting a plastic water bottle and filling it right to the very top with water and putting on the cap and squeezing. Ugh, you'll find that you can't really squeeze the bottle very much. But if you empty out half of the water, no, don't pour it on the floor, and then put the cap back on the bottle and try to squeeze it, you'll find that you can squeeze it a lot more. That's because gases compress much easier than solids or liquids. Here's what's going on. Say this container is, well, any container. And these magnets are air molecules. Now, I'm gonna put the magnets in pole to pole so they repel each other and wanna stay a certain distance apart, just like air molecules do. There we go, a container at normal gas pressure. Now, watch what happens when I add more gas molecules. They start to get squeezed together. And if I add more, the amount of space that each one gets is less and less. Now this container is under a lot of pressure. These molecules really want to escape through the top of the container, but they can't because I'm holding them down. If I took something like this plunger and I pushed them down even more, now they're really under pressure. They want to get out, but they can't because I'm holding them in. Now watch what happens when I let them go. They all pop out the top, and the container has returned to normal gas pressure. That's what happens when we put gas in a container like this one. These containers that hold compressed gas are made out of solid steel because you need something really strong or it might explode if you put too much gas pressure in it. That's why these are only filled up by professionals who know exactly how much pressure it can take. That is the power of pressure. Our air-powered rocket was working pretty well, but there's always room to max it out. In order to do that, we need to understand how it works. First, we fill the bottle almost halfway with water, then we add air to the bottle. The air pressure builds up and the air presses down on the water. The rocket takes off when we pull on the release valve, which was blocking the opening of the bottle. Once that happens, the air pushes out the water. It's the water that gives us our thrust, so the water is very important. Once all the water is gone, the air escapes and the bottle returns to normal air pressure. But by that time, it's high in the sky. Now the plan is to use two liter bottles instead of regular water bottles to see if they work better. <laughs> now we've made a few more rockets out of two liter bottles. And I'm gonna fill this one up with water and we're going to fire it, oh, fire it again and see what happens. Now with the idea is that these will work better because they have more volume and more volume means we could possibly put more air pressure in. It's hard to know until you try it, of course. But the other reason why it might work better is two liter bottles generally hold <coughs> carbonated beverages, which means they already have to be made a little stronger than regular water bottles because they have to hold in 
the carbonation, which is just like air pressure. All right, ready to go. Okay, here we go. You ready, Adam? Yep. Okay, flash shield down. Pressurize. Three, two, one. <laughs> Let's do another one. And three, two, one. Whoa! <laughs> This is the superhero design rocket, which I'm very excited about. All right, Adam, it's going really well. But before we fire this next one, yeah. how can we make it bigger, better, and more awesome? You get more pressure. More pressure. How do we do that? Well, we're firing at about 90 PSI right now. PSI, pounds per square inch exactly. of pressure, right? Yeah. So we could increase it. We could increase it. So how? We're at 90 now. How high does the tank go? Go to about 120. 120 psi. Let's see what happens. All right. Let's okay. Do it. Here we go. 90. 110. 120. Should we fire it? Let's fire it. Let's fire it. Here we go. Three, two, one. <laughs> All right. <laughs> hey, actually, it worked okay. There's just a piece missing here, but I think the bottle is still okay. Yeah. So, two liter bottle, full pressure. I think we can still make something even better, even more maxed out. Um, what if we use an even bigger bottle? You know the five liter ones that you see on a water cooler? Yeah. You think we can use one of those? Definitely. I think we could use that. We need to change the mouthpiece oh, size right. yes. to fit our launchers. Well, let's do it. Do it. I'm being crushed by all this pressure. A whole kilogram is being pushed down on every square centimeter of my body. 103 kilopascals. Ah! Actually, one kilogram for every square centimeter on your body is the exact kind of pressure that you and I are under at all times every day. We don't notice it because we're used to it, but it sounds like a lot, doesn't it? Well, it is. Here's an experiment you can do with a plastic bottle. Say, at room temperature, there are 10 million air molecules in here. Doesn't really matter how many, but we'll say there's 10 million at normal room temperature. What happens if I heat up the air inside this bottle? This is warm water. What I'm trying to do is heat up the air inside the bottle because the air molecules, when they get hotter, move faster and need more room. So the 10 million air molecules are starting to escape out the mouth of the bottle and reducing the number of air molecules inside. And now I take the bottle out and cap it. Because the air molecules heated up and speeded up, they needed more room. Now there's less of them in the bottle. There's about four million air molecules inside this bottle, but they're all hot air molecules and they have a higher pressure and you don't notice it because the air out here isn't crushing the bottle. But watch what happens if I cool the air inside the bottle. This is ice water. So what's happening now is the molecules are slowing down and they need less space. So they need less room and they're being crushed by the pressure on the outside of the bottle. <laughs> it has been crushed because the colder air molecules don't need the same kind of room as the hot air molecules. The room temperature air has crushed the bottle. The air inside has a lower pressure than the air outside. Pretty amazing even more amazing when we max it out. This is a steel drum. What we've done is we put some water in it and we're heating it up to boiling so there's nothing but hot air inside the drum. This is an airtight cap, which we use to seal the drum. And now we cool the drum off. Hey, Trevor, give me a hand. Ready? One, two, three, you lift! That's good. This pool is filled with ice. What we're doing now is cooling off the steel drum, which will cool off the air inside it, which means eventually the air inside the steel drum will be much lower pressure than the air outside the steel drum. Because the steel drum has a lot more volume than a two liter pop bottle, it takes a lot longer for the air to cool down. The other thing to think about is that it's a steel drum. 
I could stand on it and it wouldn't even dent. But sure enough, after a few minutes... Whoa! Check it out! The barrel has totally crushed. The low pressure air inside the barrel wasn't enough to withstand the force of the regular air pressure that you and I walk through every day. The air pressure all around us is enough to crush a steel drum. How cool is that? Our air-powered rockets have been working really well, but we still want to go further. Since the two-liter bottle worked better than the water bottle, we think increasing the size again might make it more awesome. So now the plan is to switch our two-liter bottle with a 20-liter water cooler jug and make a rocket out of that. Because the launcher nozzle, which holds the bottle in place till we're ready to launch it, isn't going to fit the opening of this bigger jug, we've decided to use the cap that came with the jug. If we screw the cap on, it'll work sort of like the cork. The air pressure will press down on the water and keep pushing against the cap until the cap has a catastrophic failure, which is a very cool way of saying that eventually the cap will break and the bottle will shoot into the sky. 20 liter water cooler jug filled with some water. This is the cap that'll work sort of like the cork. We put the air pressure in there, the cap can't take it anymore, pops off, and the thing flies, hopefully. Let's find out. Okay, that looks good. There. Let's do this. Go for pressure! Uh oh. Uh oh. oh no. Whoa! <laughs> It worked pretty well. It's uh, it sort of does that. I wonder if it's aerodynamic. No, no. So, how do we? What else can we do to make it even more maxed out? I think we could use the two-liter bottles that work really well. The two-liter bottles yeah. are the best, right? I think so. So, what do we do? We could probably stack them. We stack them on top of each other. Yeah. That work. I like that. I'd so we put a whole bunch of them together. Yeah. Tell you what, I'll do you one better. Why don't we use three stacks? Awesome. We'll use three stacks, three launchers three times the thrust, and we'll make a giant rocket at a two-liter bottle. Yeah, great idea. High fives. Oh, here we go. Gas molecules get further apart when you warm them up and closer together when you cool them down. So what happens if you keep cooling them down? Well, they turn into this. This is liquid nitrogen. Nitrogen makes up 78% of the air we breathe, but when you cool it down to minus 196 degrees Celsius, it turns into a liquid. It's boiling right now because at room temperature, nitrogen wants to be a gas. So the liquid nitrogen is turning into gaseous nitrogen, and all of the extra molecules are escaping through the top of the bottle. So what happens if I put a cap on the bottle? Right now, the liquid nitrogen is turning back into a gas. But because there's a cap on the bottle, the gas has nowhere to go. So the pressure is just going to keep building and building until the plastic bottle can't contain it anymore. And, 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 it pops like a balloon. Science! Our rockets have gone from small to bigger to even bigger. Now the plan is to use three two-liter bottles and create columns of them into a giant rocket. We pressurize them just like we did before, but with more thrust, it might work even better. Even if it doesn't work better, I'm pretty excited about this new plan. <laughs> giant rocket! <laughs> Giant rocket! You ready? I'm ready. Okay, blast shields down. Connecting hose. Dialing up pressure. Pressure is rising. It's bubbling. Bubbling. 100 PSI. Okay, stand by to fire. Three, two, one. Whoa! <laughs> Woo! Awesome! Yeah, let's go 
go check it out. Well, there you have it. Rocket Science Max. Experiments at large. Well done. Nicely, nicely done. Do you think we could fire it again? Yeah, yeah it looks like it needs some repairs, though. Science Max! What good is science if you can't use it to give you super strength? Well, I try to do just that on this episode of Science Max. Lifting more, rolling more, and a whole lot of running. Simple Machines, today on Science Max Experiments at Large. <sighs> Greetings, Science Maximites. I have a question for you. Have you ever wanted superpowers? Like super strength? Well, today, on Science Max Experiments at Large, I'm gonna give you and myself super strength using the power of science. But we're gonna do things a little differently today. You see, well, the portal hasn't been working perfectly since, well, since I built it. But I ordered a new particle impulse controller, and all I have to do is get it back to the lab. Uh, perfect timing. It looks like the portal, the portal is broken. Um, okay, well, no problem. Okay, okay, I'm here, I'm here. Wow. That's perfect. One particle impulse controller for you. All right, thanks very much. No problem. Appreciate it. Enjoy. Thank you. Well, my very own particle impulse controller, okay. That's as heavy as I thought I was gonna be. All right, Science Maximites, this episode of Science Max Experiments at Large is gonna be a little different because today I'm not gonna have an expert come and help me because I'm gonna move that giant, heavy particle impulse controller all the way across the parking lot and all the way up that loading ramp by myself with nobody's help. How am I gonna move a giant, heavy machine all that way if I can barely even budget? Well, I'm gonna give myself superpowers, super strength with the power of simple machines. And the first machine we're gonna start with is the lever, which I guess I should go back to the lab to tell you about. All right, Sal, I'll see you next time. Oh, hey, how you doing? Let me guess, you got some work to do and you need it done easy, right? I mean, look at this book. I mean, you could pick it up, but what, are you gonna be some sort of book picker up or person now? Is that all you're gonna do? Is that gonna be your life, just picking up books left, right, and center? No, you're smarter than that. You know what you need? A lever, like this. Now, I know what you're thinking, I know. You're thinking, hey, this is just a plank. You're right, you're, cause that's because you're smart. A plank can be a lever. All you need is two sides and a place for it to pivot, a fulcrum. It can be anything. Look at this. Bam! Now it's pivoting. I put the book on this side, and then I push down on that side. I'm doing work easy! Hey, look at me doing this work over here. If I want to do more work, I could move the fulcrum a little bit further over. Now I do lots of work, but I lift the book a lot further. Look at that. Whoa! Wow! Whoa! Yeah! Huh? What do you say? What do you say? What do you say? Huh? Huh? You don't like this lever? Don't worry. Hold on. I got another one for you here. Hey, take this stick. All you need is two ends and a place for it to pivot. Like this. Bam! Now, it's a lever. This side goes down. That side goes up. Down. Up. It's a lever. It's a lever. You want to make a catapult? Use a spoon. The place where the spoon pivots is the fulcrum. And now, it's a lever. It's a lever. It's a lever. Look at this lamp. Now, it's a lever. Scissors, two levers. Your forearm, it's a lever. Two ends and the fulcrum where it pivots. Yeah, the fulcrum can be at one end. Crazy. This fish, you guessed it. Now, it's a lever. And now, you know your levers. Uh, where were we? Oh yeah, levers. So you can use levers to become much stronger or at least lift something you couldn't normally lift. Levers are simple machines and they work like this. 
Levers are just a long rod or a stick or pole or a piece of wood like I've got here and something for them to pivot on, a fulcrum. Now let's say you have something heavy like this book. Sure, I can lift it, but what if I told you I can lift this heavy book with this book? Now if the fulcrum is in the middle like a seesaw, you can tell that book is much heavier than the other book. But watch what happens when I move the fulcrum. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Huh? It's like magic, but it's not magic, it's science. Whoa. It's because the small weight is moving a long distance and the heavy weight is moving a short distance. Small weight, long distance, heavy weight, short distance. So everything balances out. But here's where it gets interesting. The longer your lever, the more weight you can lift. These are two heavy cinder blocks. There's the fulcrum, and here is a very long lever with which I am going to lift those cinder blocks with this book. Ha <laughs> ha! And there you have it, levers. Now, back to the particle impulse controller. Oh, right. Ha 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 ha! Lever! Here we go. I got my giant lever. The bigger the lever is, the easier it is to do the work. Uh, I need a fulcrum. Oh. Uh, oh. Just about anything will do for a fulcrum. And put that there. Now the hardest part is getting it on the lever. Okay, okay. Oh. Oh. All right, hardest part is over. Uh, get the lever up on the fulcrum. Uh, and, oh, ho, ho, ho. look at this. No problem, one finger lifting. It suddenly became very easy for me to move this. I guess I need to do more than just lift it though, huh? Because I have to move it all the way. Uh, oh, rollers! Come on, back to the lab. <laughs> Okay, rollers. Rollers are like wheels, except they're not attached to anything. In ancient times, they used to move giant, heavy blocks of stone using rollers. We can demonstrate using a book. Now get a book, put it on a table, and try to move it across the table. You'll see that it's very difficult. I can't move this book across the table. I can't. Okay, it's not really that hard, but still, it takes effort. But if we get some rollers, I like to use pencil crayons and not pencils, and here's why. Take a closer look. You see, pencils aren't round. They're hexagonal. They have six sides, whereas pencil crayons are round. And of course, if you want something to roll, you want something round. So get a bunch of pencil crayons and put them on the table and put the book on the pencil crayons, and you'll see that suddenly moving it is a lot easier. All right, that's rollers. Back I go. It's time for science so simple, a caveman could do it. This is a caveman. Ah. This is a rock. Ah. Knock. It is a well-known scientific fact that if this caveman were to try to move ah. that rock, he would not know how to do it easily. Poor caveman. Ah. Ah. But in ancient times, people learned how to move heavy rocks using ropes. Uh, no. And rollers. Oh. Wronger. Yes, rollers. No. Wronger. R rollers. Rollers. Close enough. Rollers make it much easier to move a heavy object. <laughs> But they aren't perfect. So the wheel was invented. The wheel is a simple machine and one of mankind's greatest inventions. But no, no, that's not how it works. No? Wheels go on axles, which go under a platform. Now you have something to place that heavy rock on to move it around. But all these great 
inventions came after the time of the caveman. Cavemen had to do everything the hard way. <laughs> Join us next time for more science. <laughs> Okay, I've got rollers. They're just plastic pipes, but they'll work perfectly. And I put them here. And now to lift up the machine. Okay. Perfect. And so the rollers go underneath like that. And then. Whoa. Whoa, careful. Uh-huh. Look at that. No problem. Wait, I gotta get rid of this up to get it okay. moving. Now the trick with rollers is you have to keep taking them out of the back and putting them in the front. But whoa, whoa, whoa. It's Stop, rollers, stop, oh no, oh no. Okay, okay, whoa, rollers, easy. There we go. Okay, in the front, roll it forward. Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking this seems like a lot of work, and it's true, moving the rollers back and forth and back and forth does take some time. But did you know this was how the pyramids were built? It's true. Giant stone blocks were moved on rollers just like I'm doing here. And as you can see, what worked for the ancient Egyptians works for me too. Uh-oh. Yeah, there's a hill here. Um, if I go down the hill, it's gonna start rolling faster than I can do the rollers. I'm gonna need some help. Um, uh, oh, I know, pulleys, pulleys, pulleys. Okay, pulleys. Pulleys are a great way to change the direction of force. I've got a rope going through this pulley and down to a book, so when I pull the rope down, the book goes up. Changing the direction of force can be very helpful, but pulleys can be helpful in another way. Pulleys can let you lift something that you couldn't normally lift. Now the rope goes up and down and up and down and up and down. And the force I need to lift this cinder block is a lot less than if I was just lifting it by myself. But I've got to pull a lot more rope. That's called mechanical advantage. Spreading out the force over a longer pull so you can lift a larger weight. If you use more pulleys, it reduces the amount of force. One pulley, same amount. Two pulleys, half the force. Three pulleys, one third. So I've got five pulleys here, which means I only need one fifth the force to lift this cinder block. <laughs> so there you go, pulleys. Now back to the, wait a minute, wait a minute. This calls for a mini max. So how much weight can you lift with pulleys? Well, as much as you want, really. I have four pulleys on the bottom and four pulleys at the top. That means with eight pulleys, I only have to lift one eighth of my weight plus the weight of the chair I'm sitting in. And if I keep pulling, you will see that the chair I'm sitting in is roped to the pulleys. So now we see if I can pull myself up with nothing but pulleys. Look at that! I'm totally lifting myself into the air with the power of pulleys. And I don't need to use two hands. In fact, I only need to use one finger to hold myself up. And my thumb, obviously, to hold the rope. That is the power of pulleys. I can almost make myself fly! Well, almost. Now, back to the particle impulse controller. Letting myself down. Particle impulse controller. 
Let's go! Wait. to use this pulley to lower it down the hill at the speed I want to go. Interestingly, I'm using the pulley not to make it lighter, but to just change the direction of force. And I managed to get it right here at the bottom. Now, I've got to get it up onto the loading dock, so I think this is where I need a ramp. Whoa, whoa. Oh. something mind-bending you can do with pulleys. These buckets are attached to the table through a pulley. There's nothing holding this table up except for the weight of the buckets pushing down on the table. So if I took the buckets off the table, the weight of the buckets pulls the table up. But because the buckets are on the table, everything is in balance. Mind-bending, right? OK, wait, it gets better. If I took a weight and I put it on the table, the weight of the buckets isn't enough to keep the table up. So I have to add more weight to the buckets so the buckets pull the table up. Whoa. And there you have it. It's weird, it's mind-bending, it's science. Okay, okay, ramps. Ramps are a great way to move something up. I will demonstrate using, you guessed it, a book. Let's say I wanted to move this heavy book on top of this stack of books using just this little string. Watch what happens. The string breaks, but if I built a ramp to get the book on top of this stack, and I use the same kind of string. Watch what happens this time. Whoa. You see, the ramp distributes the force, so you use less force to pull the book over a, the same amount of distance, and I can get it up to the top of st the stack of books, and the string doesn't break. So ramps, let's put them into action. Woo. My simple machines have worked great. I've managed to get the particle impulse controller all the way to the loading dock. But now it's time for the hardest job. What I need to do is build a ramp that goes from the ground up to the loading dock. Then I need to pull the heavy impulse controller up the ramp. The best way to do that is to use a system of pulleys. I have three pulleys on one end and two pulleys on the controller. Because I have five pulleys working together, I'll only have to lift one-fifth of the weight. The plan is to get it tipped over onto the ramp, then use rollers to help it roll up as I pull on the rope. There's three pulleys on that piece of wood over there, and I got two pulleys on this piece of wood here. And now, if I pull and I carefully put the rollers underneath, careful, careful. Perfect! <laughs> Okay, now it's on the rollers, and now I can pull it up the ramp. Now, I gotta carefully put new rollers underneath as I go. Pull it up the ramp. Roller. I know what you're thinking. It still seems pretty difficult. If only the simple machines could give me longer arms. Well, they can't do that. But what they can do is give me the strength to do this heavy job with no one else around but me. 
Hopefully that won't be a problem. <laughs> there we go. I did it. All the way across the parking lot and up onto the loading dock with the help of levers, rollers, ramps, and pulleys. The hard part's done. Now I just have to get it into the lab. All right. Let's see if all that effort was worth it. Uh, huh? <laughs> I think it's working. Well, there you go. Thanks very much for joining me on Science Max Experiments at Large. I think I'm going to go home because it's been a long day and I could really use the rest. See you next time. One, two. I should have hit three, four, two, one. That was my, that was, uh, yeah, that's okay. I'll just go back and, um. Science Max! Put on your helmets for this episode of Science Max. We try to build a human-sized cart powered by inertia. Plus, Newton's laws from a caveman to crockery. Inertia on <laughs> Science Max Experiments at Large. Greetings, race fans and science maximites. I am Phil McCordick, and this is Science Max, Experiments at Large. Today, we're going to be experimenting with the drag racer. Huh? Pretty cool. It works like this. You pull the string and get the wheels going really fast, and then you let it go, and it just drives away on its own. The interesting thing is I don't have to push it. It goes by itself. It all has to do with Newton's first law of motion, which is an object at rest tends to stay at rest, and an object in motion tends to stay in motion. Uh, yeah. Let's get building. Here is everything you need to build your very own dragster. You need some popsicle sticks, some straws, and some shish kebab skewers. I love these. You can get these at the grocery store. Uh, let's see, some elastics, and of course you want wheels, and I just cut my wheels out of cardboard. So here's a quick explanation of how to build your dragster. First, use anything round to trace three circles out on your piece of cardboard. Remember, you want two big and one small circle. Then, cut out your wheels. Then it's time to make the frame of the dragster using popsicle sticks and elastics. Just put two popsicle sticks together, then wrap the elastic band around them to keep them together. First, you build one side, then the other side. Then, add some pieces across the middle to give it support. Remember not to put any popsicle sticks too near the ends because they'll get in the way of your wheels. Next, cut the straws into small pieces and use an elastic band to tie them to the ends of the popsicle sticks. Then it's just a matter of sticking the shish kebab skewer in a wheel, passing it through the straws, and sticking on the other wheel. Don't forget that the small wheel goes in the middle at the front. You can trim the skewers afterward by just breaking it off short. If you want step-by-step -step directions on exactly how to do this, you can go to our website. It's all right there. Now the last part is wrap some string around the back axle so you can pull and the wheels will spin. Let's check it out and see how it works. Didn't work that well, did it? That's because we haven't added the secret ingredient. Plasticine, the perfect secret ingredient for all of your dragster needs. And also sculpting, because that's what it's for. Remember how I said an object at rest tends to stay at rest, and an object in motion tends to stay in motion? Well, the heavier something is, the more force you need to change its direction, either get it moving or make it stop. That is called inertia. It's the tendency for an object to resist a change in motion, either getting it going or making it stop. So, the heavier we make the wheels of our dragster, the more they will resist a change in motion. So what I've done is I've stretched out my plasticine, and then you roll the wheels of the dragster around in the plasticine, and this will make each wheel way heavier than just the cardboard by itself and it will make it much better in terms of keeping the dragster going 
because if the wheel has more weight, it will have more inertia. Now, I have to wrap the string around the back axle, just like that, and there we go. All right, let's try it out. All right, let's give it a shot and see how it works. Pull on the string, get the wheels going real fast, and there it goes. Now, of course, this is Science Max Experiments at Large, and we are going to do it again, and we're going to do it much, much bigger. That's why I'm going to the Center for Skills Development and Training. Uh, I thought it was bigger. Oh, right. Hey, Chris. Hey, Phil. How you doing? Chris is from Logics Academy. Logics Academy, and he is going to help me max out our dragster. Now, you guys at Logics Academy go into schools and build all kinds of cool stuff with the students, right? That's absolutely right. This is our dragster over here, actually. And uh, this one has an electric motor, which is kind of fun. And these gears touch. Ooh. Wheels get going. I like that. And... Ooh. Oh, all right. See, our dragster works on good old human power. You pull the string. And there it goes. Now, you have a physics degree, right? I do. Which means you know Newton's first law of motion. Of course. An object at rest tends to stay at rest. And an object in motion tends to stay in motion. I thought it was going to come from over there. All right, Chris, uh, I want to make a dragster big enough that we can ride. Whoa, OK. Uh, well, it's going to have to be pretty big. Yeah, I think we have enough wood, though, right? Yeah. And like oh, look, I've got some wheels. Perfect. These are bike tires. And I filled them full of air, so they're bouncy. Check Excellent. it out. Oh, it's OK. <laughs> so yeah, we build our frame out of wood, Yeah. attach the tires on, and then find a way to get them spinning. And if the tires are spinning, yeah. we don't actually have to push the cart because it'll just go on its own? That's the idea. The inertia should carry, in the wheels, should carry us down the track. So in this case, the object in motion is the wheels. That's right. And it wants to stay in motion, which means that when it hits the ground, it'll push the cart. And hopefully us too. And hopefully us too. All right, let's get building. Let's do it. So Chris and I get to work building the dragster. Our maxed out version is gonna look just like the popsicle stick version. A triangular frame with two large wheels at the back and a small one at the front. What's more, we're gonna do the same thing to get the wheels spinning. We're gonna attach a rope and give it a pull. When we drop it down, the inertia of the wheels should make the dragster take off. All right, here we have our dragster. This is nice, Chris. Yeah, it looks good. So um, the only thing I don't understand is what are these for? Right, so these are going to help us lift the wheels off the ground, like this. Oh, Ugh. okay. Pull it back, and what's going to happen is we're going to run wow. real fast with that string, and we're going to give a little kick, and hopefully it'll take off. Yeah, all right, I like it. So I just run backwards as fast as I can? As fast as you can. All right, here we go. Ready? Yep, ready. OK, safety glasses on. And, oh, wait, uh, did you want to sit on it, or? Oh, right. Um, let's wait until we see it working, and then we can. OK, dry run. OK, dry run. Ready? Go. Run, Phil. And go. Yeah! <laughs> so here's what happened. Remember, the cart has no power of its own. It was able to drive away from a stop using the inertia it got from its spinning wheels and a little bit from Chris's kick. That worked pretty well. That was awesome. Yeah. I think, I think we can make it go even better. You think so? I just think we need a bit more speed. Yeah. All right, well, let's pull it back to the start. OK. So what, we just, the wheels weren't going fast enough? Yeah, I think so. I think that you running, I mean, was great, but maybe if we use something motorized. Well, I think I'm, using a motor feels like cheating. No, 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 not on the wheels. Maybe, um... Oh, just to get the wheels spinning fast. Yes, that's right. But what do we, I don't know how that would work. Well, I was thinking a power drill. A power drill? Yeah. I don't get it. Okay. How do we use a drill? Let me explain. So we'll take a drill. Right. And we'll attach it right under this axle here. And that'll get the wheel spinning a lot faster than we had it before. Oh, I see. So you put the drill right here at the end, and it, right. it'll, it'll spin the wheel. That's right. Huh. That's the idea, anyway. And once we get it up to speed, hopefully a lot faster than before, give it a kick, it should go a lot farther. OK, great. So that's, that's way better than me running all the way back with the rope. I think so. All right. Uh, now, here's the real question. Should we just go for it and have someone ride it when we do it with the drill? Well, who gets to ride it? Oh, rock, paper, scissors. OK. Let's go. One, two, three. Oh, yes. all right. Uh, I will get a drill. OK. What kind of bit do we need? Uh, hex bit. Mini 
Here's a fun experiment you can try. If you have something heavy, like this glass of water, and you put it on a piece of paper, you can experiment with inertia. If you move the paper slowly, the glass moves with the paper because the friction between the paper and the glass is enough to overcome the inertia of the glass. But if you move the paper quickly, the friction is not enough to overcome the inertia, and the glass stays put. And now, let's max it out. OK, let's do it. All right, now you might be tempted to try this at home, and you can, but please, for me, promise that you'll let an adult know you're about to do this. And don't, don't use breakable plates. Use plastic plates, because this will take a couple times of practicing before you get it right. Put something on the plastic plates, because the heavier they are, the better it will work. All right. Uh, did I mention not to do this at home unless an adult knows you're doing it? I cannot stress that enough. OK, deal? All right, deal. Here we go. <laughs> and there you go. Newton's first law. Thank you. Our dragster worked pretty well. But now we're gonna try sitting on it and seeing if the inertia of the wheels is enough to accelerate the dragster and the human rider. Because we're gonna need a lot more inertia, we're gonna make the wheels spin even faster using a drill. All right, power tools! Yeah, power tools! When I attach the drill to the wheel, it works really well. Yeah, that is really gonna work. All right, let's do it for real. So uh, what do you want, helmet or blast shield? Blast shield. Blast shield. All right, there you go. You ready? Go. There you go. Whoa, man. Okay. Remember, the faster the wheels are spinning, the more inertia they will have. Ready? Ready. And... <laughs> well... What happened? <laughs> uh... So you went, you went a foot! One foot! So why didn't that work uh, nearly as well as the last time we did it? Well, I think my extra weight caused a bit of the problem. Yeah. So the inertia wasn't able to carry us forward. But the whole the whole point of this is so that someone can ride the That's dragster. Because why, why build it if you can't ride it? That's exactly right. I think if we're going to have someone ride it, we need heavier wheels. Well, on the small one, we use plasticine. Yeah. To, I don't know if that's what we can we mm, should use. What if we used car tires? Car tires. Oh, how, what, on this? No, I think we're going to have to build something bigger. So we, OK, so we build a whole new frame. Yep. What if we got like the axle of, like the back axle of a car or something? It's a great idea. The back axle of a car? And then what, we, we use the drill? I don't think the drill is going to be enough. To move the, why? You don't think it's going to be enough to move the back axle of a car? Yeah, it's too, yeah, too oh. big. So what do we do? Well, what's good at moving the back axle of a car? Well, I mean a car, but we would have to take it off the car, so. We could use another car. We could use another, we could use, we could use another we could, car. We could use another car. Um, You'll have to explain how that works. OK. Uh, let's, go, let's go get the, uh, the stuff, and you can tell me how we're going to use. So how do we use another car to make the first car go? OK, I'm thinking we jack one car up, yeah. back our big dragster. Newton's Laws in 60 seconds. <laughs> Isaac Newton was a super genius, and among the many things he did was come up with three laws of motion that describe how everything moves or doesn't move. I will demonstrate using myself. Newton's first law, an object at rest tends to stay at rest. An object in motion tends to stay in motion. Newton's third law is for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Ugh. These sandbags weigh as much as I do. So when I push them forward, ugh, I go backward the same distance. Now, Newton's second law is F equals ma. Force equals mass times acceleration. How hard you push something is equal to its mass or its weight 
times its acceleration or how much you change its speed. I know, that one's a little bit more complicated, so we're gonna have a whole other segment describing that one coming up. Meantime, let's recap. Newton's first law, object at rest tends to stay at rest, object in motion tends to stay in motion. Newton's third law, for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. Newton's second, fma! Newton's three laws of motion. Now how do I, how do I get down? How do I, how do I get, oh wait, I know, I know. Oh no, that was that was not a good idea. That was. Now it's time for science so simple a caveman could do it. This is a caveman. Huh? This is a door. It is a well-known scientific fact that cavemen do not know how to open doors. Huh? Ah! This is Newton's second law. Force equals mass times acceleration. Ma? Our caveman thinks he can open the door if he uses force. Ah, yeah. Well, what if he was to walk briskly into the door? Uh, no, I... Then the force that he will hit the door with will be equal to his mass, or how much he weighs, times his acceleration, which will be walking speed to zero. It didn't work, did it? No. Looks like we need more force. If we want to increase the force, we need to increase the mass, increase the acceleration, or both. A rock! That's perfect. Uh. If the caveman holds the rock, he has a greater mass. Now we just need to increase the acceleration, which means going faster. Uh. Let's try running. Uh. Go on. A little further. That's good. Now the caveman is going to run at the door. To get more force, we've increased the mass to a caveman plus a rock. And we've increased the acceleration to go from running speed to zero. And there you have it. That's how Newton's second law works. Join us next time for how doorknobs work. Our inertia power dragster just wasn't maxed out enough. So Chris and I built a second dragster, the Dragster Mark II. This one is a welded metal frame, and instead of bike tires, we're using car tires because they're much heavier than bike tires. And to get the tires spinning fast enough, we're going to use a car. That's right, we jack up an actual car and have the tires touch each other. Then we can get those heavy tires spinning fast enough to get enough inertia to get me going from nothing. The Science Max build team pulled out all the stops on this one. Just like the smaller version, the dragster has to be up on jacks so the wheels don't touch the ground as they get spun up. The wheels of the dragster touch the wheels of this working car, which is also jacked up. That's how we're gonna get them spinning fast enough. Chris is over there. He's got a rope just like I'm gonna have a rope. And when we're ready, we're going to run forward and pull it off the jacks, and our dragster will go! We hope, right? That's the plan, right? Yep. All right. I think it's gonna work. I think we should do it. Uh, ready, Chris? Ready. You ready, Paul? Ready. Fire it up. Go, go, go. Faster, faster, faster. Keep going. Faster, faster. Keep going. All right, Chris. After three, right? One, two, three, go! <laughs> Nice. It's pretty good. Yeah, that worked. All right, I think, are we ready for me to be in it? I think so. All right, we're gonna do it. The helmet's in the, in the Max Van. Do you have the keys for the Max Van? Uh... uh keys for the Max Van. Max. Here's another small experiment you can do with inertia. Take a stack of checkers, or game pieces like I have here, oh, or coins, coins work really well, and a ruler, or something else that's flat. This is the kind of stick they give you at the hardware store to stir your paint with. Now you can knock checkers out of the middle of the stack without the stack falling over, if you're very careful. You see, the friction of the checkers leaving the middle of the stack won't be enough to overcome the inertia of the rest of the checkers. Ready? <laughs> 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 
Now, let's max it out. Oh, I have these pizza boxes, and they should work the same way. You see, you get a stack, and don't worry, I've already eaten all the pizza. And I put them on there like that, and now I need a ruler. And what I've got is this cricket bat. You see, it's got a nice flat edge, just like the ruler. Now, if this works right, I can hit it hard enough to knock out just one or two pizza boxes, and the rest of the stack should stay. Here we go, ready? <laughs> Science! Awesome. <laughs> and there you have it, Newton's first law. An object at rest tends to stay at rest, and an object in motion tends to stay in motion. An object in motion tends to stay in motion. Usually there's a sign that kind of... Well, our inertia power dragster worked oh, really well. Camera. And now it's time for the <laughs> final step. Me, All right. riding it to glory. Okay. Now, I, I know it probably doesn't need saying, but don't try this at home. Not that I, I think you really can try this at home because this is kind of involved, but I figured I should probably tell you guys just in case you were tempted to try it at home. We know what we're doing. We know what we're doing, right, Chris? Yes. Yes, yes, we know what we're doing. All right, fire it up. Keep it going, keep it going. All the way, Whoa. all the way. Three, two, one, go! <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Woo! How's that for inertia? <laughs> wow, look at that. That's amazing. Cool. High fives! Yeah! <laughs> Let's recap. The weight of the tires, as well as how fast they were going, provided enough inertia to accelerate me and the weight of the dragster. The objects in motion, the wheels, wanted to stay in motion so much, they moved the dragster all by themselves. Inertia! and Newton's first law of motion. Thank you for joining us on Science Max. Let's go again. Your okay. turn? Yeah, my turn. Okay. Woo. <laughs> yeah! My name is Phil, and I take your everyday science experiments and do them big. This is Science Max, experiments at large.